5 SDM and welcome to our book this term. It is starting off as we've spoken about The Wreck of the Zanzibar by Michael Morpurgo. You guys have done loads of fantastic research about him and this is one of his books along with as you can see at the top um, from the author of War Horse and we'll look at some of the other books that are recommended inside by him. Um, there are lots of different covers of this but this is a nice one um, and we'll find out who that is on the front shortly um but let's go through the opening pages and just like in any other book we start off with other things also written by michael morpurgo and there might be a few names there that you recognize or that you included in your set of google slides uh why the whales came at the bottom and then on the next page we've got a few more um and then we get into um, the stuff that we would find inside a normal book. So the table of contents, so what you'd find on each page. And we can see that lots of the chapters are named after dates, and that will become clear as to why shortly. Um, further chapters towards the end of the book. And then our dedication, who Michael Morpurgo dedicates the book to, that is Marion, Keith, Daniel and Charlie. So let's begin the first chapter. And that is called Great Aunt Laura. My great aunt Laura died a few months ago. She was a hundred years old. She had her cocoa lasting at night, as she usually did, put the cat out, went to sleep and never woke up. There's not a better way to die. I took the boat across to Scilly for the funeral. Almost everyone in the family did. I met again cousins and aunts and uncles I hardly recognised and who hardly recognised me. The little church on Briar was packed, standing room only. Everyone on Briar was there and they came from all over the Silly Isles, from St Mary's, St Martin's, St Agnes and Tresco. We sang the hymns lustily because we knew Great Aunt Laura would enjoy a rousing send-off. Afterwards, we had a family gathering in her tiny cottage overlooking stinking Porth Bay. There was tea and crusty brown bread and honey. I took one mouthful and I was a child again. Wanting to be on my own, I went up the narrow stairs to the room that, I, that had been mine when I came every summer for my holidays. The same oil lamp was by the bed, the same peeling wallpaper, the same faded curtains with the red sailing boats dipping through the waves. I sat down on the bed and closed my eyes. I was eight years old again and ahead of me were two weeks of sand and sea and boats and shrimping and oyster catchers and gannets and great aunt Laura's stories every night before she drew the curtains against the moon and left me alone in my bed. Someone called from downstairs and I was back to now. Everyone was crowded into her sitting room. There was a cardboard box open in the middle of the floor. Ah, there you are, Michael, said Uncle Will. He was a little bit irritated, I thought. We'll begin then. And a hush fell around the room. He dipped into the box and held up a parcel. It looks as if she's left us one each, said Uncle Will. Every parcel was wrapped in old newspaper and tied with string and there was a large brown label attached to each one. Uncle Will read out the names. I had to wait some minutes for mine. There was nothing I particularly wanted, except Zanzibar, of course, but then everyone wanted Zanzibar. Uncle Will was waving a parcel at me. Michael, he said, here's yours. I took it upstairs and unwrapped it sitting on the bed. It felt like a book of some sort, and so it was, but not a printed book. It was handmade, handwritten in pencil, the pages sewn together. The title on the cover read, The Diary of Laura Perryman, and there was a watercolour painting on the cover of a four-masted ship keeling over in a storm and heading for the rocks. With the book there was an envelope. I opened it and read. Dear Michael, when you were little I told you lots and lots of stories about Briar, about the Isles of Scilly. You know about the ghosts on Samson, about the bell that rings under the sea off St Martin's, about King Arthur still waiting in his cave under the Eastern Isles. You remember? Well, here is my story, the story of me and my twin brother Billy, whom you never knew. How I wish you had. 
It's a true story, and I did not want it to die with me. When I was young, I kept a diary, not an everyday diary. I didn't write in it very often, just whenever I felt like it. Most of it isn't worth the reading, and I've already thrown it away. I've lived an ordinary sort of life, but for a few months, a long, long time ago, my life was not ordinary at all. This is the diary of those few months. Do you remember you always used to ask where Zanzibar came from? You called him Marzipan when you were small. (laughs) I never told you, did I? I never told anyone. Well, now you'll find out at last. Goodbye, dear Michael, and God bless you. Your great Aunt Laura. P.S. I hope you like my little sketches. I'm a better artist than I am a writer, I think. When I come back in my next life, and I shall, I shall be a great artist, I've promised myself. So we can see here that Michael, the character in our book, has opened the diary of Laura Perryman, the diary of his great aunt Laura. And the following pages and chapters in the book follow the story that Laura is telling in her early years. And so we're going to read the first instalment of her diary, the first chapter um, that Michael is reading in his great aunt Laura's house um, after her funeral. So, this is starting on January the 20th. Laura Perryman, you are 14 years old today. I said that to the mirror this morning when I wished myself happy birthday. Sometimes, like this morning, I don't much want to be Laura Perryman, who's lived on Briar all her life and milks cows. I want to be Lady Eugenia Fitzherbert, with long red hair and green eyes, who wears a big white hat with a white ostrich feather, and who travels the world in steamships with four funnels. But then I also want to be Billy Perryman, so I can row out in the gig and build boats and run fast. Billy's fourteen too, being my twin brother, he would be. But I'm not Lady Eugenia Fitzherbert, whoever she is, and I'm not Billy, I'm me. I'm Laura Perryman, and I'm 14 years old today. Everyone is pleased with me, even father, because I was the one who spotted the ship before they did on St Mary's. It was just that I was in the right place at the right time, that's all. I'd been milking the cows with Billy, as usual, and I was coming back with the buckets over Watch Hill when I saw sails on the horizon of out beyond White Island. It looked like a schooner, three-masted. We left the buckets and ran all the way home, The gig was launched in five minutes. I watched the whole thing from the top of Sampson Hill with everyone else. We saw the St Mary's gig clear the harbour wall. The wind and the tide in her favour. The race was on. For some time, it looked as if the St Mary's gig would reach the schooner first, as she so often does. But we found clear water and a fair wind out beyond Sampson, and we were flying along. I could see the chief holding on to the mast and Billy and father pulling side by side in the middle of the boat. How I wanted to be one of them, to be out there rowing with them. I can handle an oar as well as Billy. He knows it, everyone knows it. But the chief won't hear of it and he's the coxswain. And neither will father. They think that's the end of it. But it isn't. One day, one day. Anyway, today we won the race so I should be pleased about that, I suppose. The St Mary's boat lost an oar. She was left dead in the water and had to turn back. We watched our gig draw alongside the schooner and we all cheered till we were hoarse. Through the telescope, I could see the chief climbing up the ladder to pilot the schooner into St Mary's. I could see them helping him on board, then shaking hands with him. He took off his cap and waved and we all cheered again. It would mean money for everyone and there's precious little of that going around. When the gig came back into Great Porth, we were all there to meet her. We helped haul her up the beach. She's always lighter when we've won. Father hugged me and Billy winked at me. It's an American ship, he says, the General Lee, bound for New York. She'll be tied up in St Mary's for repairs to her mizzenmast and could be there a week, maybe more. This evening, Billy and I had our birthday cake from Granny May as usual. The chief and crew were all there as well, so the cake didn't last long. They sang happy birthday to us, 
And then the chief said, we were all a little less poor because Laura Perryman had spotted the General Lee and I felt good. They were all smiling at me. Now's the time, I thought. I'll ask them again. Can I row the bill? Can I row with Billy in the gig? They all laughed and said what they always said, that girls don't row in gigs. They never had. I went to the hen house and cried. It's the only place I can cry in peace. And then Granny May came in with the last piece of cake and said there are plenty of things that women can do that men can't. It doesn't seem that way to me. I want to row in that gig and I will. One day I will. Billy came into my room just now. He's had another argument with Father. This time the milk buckets weren't clean enough. There's always something and Father will shout at him so. Billy says he wants to go to America and that one day he will. He's always saying things like that. I wish he wouldn't. It frightens me. I wish Father would be kinder to him. That's the end of the first chapter of The Wreck of the Zanzibar or of late of Laura Perryman's diary being read by Michael. Um, I wonder when you think she might have been 14. What kind of date or year um, might she have lived on the Isles of Scilly? For maybe something for you to think about or to do a bit of research and reading about um, and think about what evidence there might have been in the chapter for that. Um, head now to the Google Slides and see what you have got in 